Welcome to the show. We're very happy to have you here. It's a great pleasure to be here, Ashaya. You're an explorer, an author, a teacher and a speaker. I think the people listening to this would like to hear most about your experiences as an explorer. Can you tell us about it? Gosh, that's a very big question. Well, I think that um, the fact I'm an explorer with more of a historical purpose. So I don't go exploring new lands and the ends of rivers because that's all really been done. Now I recreate the journeys of the first women explorers who in my mind were gathering information about the culture of the lands. And that's what's so interesting. And because of that, they've taken me to some of the most remote places on earth and it's always been very extreme travel and it's not been very comfortable travel. But they kind of took me there and um, and their books are testimony to uh, those countries before technology and before great you know, globalization really. You've been doing you've been doing a special explorers project for over ten years now. Would you like to talk about it and what inspired you to do it? Okay, that's a great question. Well, I was I was teaching and um, I had been burning to to, to recreate a journey that um, of a, of the first woman down the Amazon um, for many years, and I had to wait till my son went off to university till I can do that. That uh, that story just. It just absolutely fueled my imagination of what it must have been like for a woman in 1769 to leave her home and to travel links the Amazon. So the first one I did, the first expedition I did was that first 500 miles. And uh, I had left teaching to do it. And while I was away, uh, I realized that this was, this, I was onto something. This was very interesting because when I got back, People wanted to hear this story. And the more that they asked me, you know, about her story and about how she made it, and the more I felt I wanted to go and do another journey. So then I began my reading of the books of the, of the first women explorers. And I have a great library now of all, mostly secondhand books. And I decided for the second one that I would climb, although I'm, I'm not a climber, you know, I'm never climbed a mountain but I decided that I wanted to recreate the journey of Mary Kingsley up Mount Cameroon because Mary Queen Kingsley did that journey against the odds. I mean she had lost her parents, she was single, she she was very much trapped into Victorian society and the expectations of women and I think that was a great drive for many of these women in the 1890s particularly that they felt trapped in England as a spinster, as we call them. And they felt they had very few opportunities, careers were hard, you couldn't go to university. And so travel was an option, but it came at a great cost. And for Mary Kingsley, just to, just to book a passage on a ship and go to West Africa and get off in Yeundi and decide to climb a mountain was a phenomenal thing in those days. So I did, I did the same, I did her same journey and um, I, had, I had some women with me and we did, we did get out at the top and uh, our, we did get out of our pack some, a Victorian dress that we were carrying each and put them on over our trousers and we, we, we tried to capture the spirit of how hard it must have been for her in the pouring rain solidly. I mean, she never was able to get her clothes off actually ever. So I felt then I was beginning to feel that spirit of being a Victorian woman and, and their, then get, how getting away gave them that freedom. So then I continued on my reading 
And I decided after that that, um, well, in the meantime, I led the I, I led the first British-led expedition to search for the Inca gold in the Janganatis Mountains in, in Ecuador, in the Andes. Um, then I decided that the Cape Master, a, a, Brit, a, a, a nurse from London, her journey across Siberia was so incredible that I was going to try and replicate that. But that was hard because the Russians didn't want to give me much of a visa, you know, just 30 days. I had a lot, a lot of traveling to do in that time. But I did manage to go from overland, from starting off in Moscow, Nov Novosibirsk, trying to go the same way as Kate Marston, who was going to try and document the way that lepers were treated in Eastern Siberia. And when we reached this village in Eastern Siberia, we found that she was still celebrated 125 years later. There was there were people who there was, they held a, a, a torch for her, and they held festivals for her, and they had an English prize in the college for her. And you're talking about a tiny village in the forest that. Um, is, has no Wi-Fi and it has no proper road to it. It's 500 miles of track to get to it. That was very uncomfortable travel, but it was really worthwhile. And I'd go back a couple of years after that to give a speech and to and to get to, to develop my relationship with them further. Then after that, um, oh no, in the meantime, I had climbed through Northern Ladakh in India in the footsteps of Isabella Bird. Isabella Bird, whose biography I've now written. And I, she went on a yak and there weren't any yaks, so I had to walk 150 miles, which was absolutely delightful. But I really felt in that Ladakh one, in eight, she went in 1890, 1889, I really felt that I was almost Isabella Bird when I did that journey up into Northern India because um, I found this place when she stayed at, I recognized from her book, the pictures on the wall, painted onto the mud of this home she, she lived in. I stood on this same spot in the Digar Pass and looked out over the, the lower Himalayas, exactly the same as her and camped in the same places. And that was um, pretty extraordinary. And that was very beautiful. I mean, it's very beautiful. And I would never have gone to those places if it hadn't been for them, because they kind of drew me there. I, I'm not sure I would ever have stood on that pass in Ladakh and stood and looked out over, over that view if it hadn't been Isabella leading me there. Um, and then, uh, then unfortunately, sort of lockdown did, did, put everything on a, on a hold. We all stopped to travel for a while, didn't we? And um, I have another trip coming up. But in the meantime, I, I've written three books and I am very, I, I just feel very honored to have visited some of these extraordinary places and got to know these people locally and witness traditional ceremonies the same way as, as they did. Some of them, the same traditional ceremonies. And I can read their books and I can see what life was like for them and, and what it's like now. Yes, so that's that's what has driven me, yes. That is amazing. Do you think so? Amazing or mad? Amazing. Oh good, thank you, that's great. <laughs> would, you, would you do the same? I would, well I would try. Would you? Um, one of the last things I did was travel the whole length of the Amazon River because when I told you that I left teaching to do the first 500 miles, after that it kind of, um, I just kind of thought I really wanted to know what it was like to do 4,300 miles, how Isabella Godin felt when she was doing that journey. And so I did finally get to go and do the whole journey. And I think that's probably got to be the hardest because for me, it was a lot of that was to do with survival. And when I talk to people, not many people would want to do that. I mean, it's like keeping, keeping um, yourself you're healthy and finding clean water and um, finding food and 
the worst part, and I know I know you're going to ask me about danger, but probably the worst part was 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 getting down a part of the, a tributary that I had to go through because, of course, it's not just a question of going down the Amazon; it's a question of going down the tributaries that lead to the Amazon through all the rainforest. And there was one very dangerous river called the River Rio Pastaza, which the Peruvian embassy said, oh no, you shouldn't go that way. And I said, but I don't want to go that way. I'm not recreating the same journey as Isabella Godin and kind of, they raised their eyebrows and went, okay. And then I, I found a, a guide who understood all the tribes. And without him, I don't think I could have done it because it was just far too dangerous. And I put a party together of people to help me afford his his fee because, you know, these things don't come cheap because he's putting him, his life at risk as well. And uh, yeah, I, I, I think now that I would quite like to go back to the Amazon and do that journey again. But then at the time I said, I would never go back because of disease and nasty bugs. And, and I said, trying to trying to get keep clean you know it was really difficult yeah and safe, of course yeah i can see you travel down the amazon river with me wouldn't you <laughs> i would try i mean you would try, I yes. really dangerous but also super exciting it was super exciting. it was quite tedious though because it took a long time and you spent a lot of time in hammock boats and if you like hammocks, that's great. But when you're in a hammock boat, this is when you get actually onto the Amazon. This is how you travel. This is how local people travel. Boats are designed to have decks with just iron bars where people hang up their hammocks. And that's how the local people travel up and down the river. And um, so you hang up your hammock and then you wake up in the morning and there's somebody really next, close next to you. And then by the time you get a bit further down, I mean, literally, you've got someone above you and, and you're knocking into each other and um, <laughs> an experience. And that's lovely to be able to travel the same way as the local people and to not, not to be in any way um, on another level. You, in terms of privilege, you're with them and, and they are just the greatest people. And I think that that was something that I won't forget was the experience of getting to know all the different people that live along the, the banks of the Amazon River. Yeah. Which have been your most exciting expeditions? <laughs> exciting? Well, I suppose it's the Amazon. But then on the other hand, crossing Siberia was also very exciting because of the people and the being introduced to a most amazing Siberian culture. And, and they would they dressed up in costume for me, just for me, because they don't get visitors in eastern Siberia. And so they would put on this full, full national costume for me at my arrival. And, and I was like, that's humbling, very, very humbling when you find a whole village has come out in costume, national costume, to meet you and to sing for you and to warm <laughs> you and put you on local television. That's very exciting, but in terms of rawness and like, you know, just pitching up on a, on the bank on a tribute to the Amazon and, and, and going and putting your tent up and having to stay safe and that that's also exciting. So there's kind of different levels of excitement really. Um, climbing the mountain in Mount Cameroon is, I'm not a climber and I don't really, really enjoy high altitudes. So I can't say that that was enjoyable for me, but there was, of course, there was an element of excitement because when you climb Mount Cameroon, you climb through rainforest and suddenly there's this line and you cross that line and there is the mountain. Rainforest just stops. And I found that thrilling in terms of scenery and you know, where I was and having my guides performing a, a local ceremony with, with branches that they cut and, and singing a special song so that we get up the mountain safely and I'm just like singing a song to the mountain gods. That's also exciting. Um, and in Ladakh, sitting 
with a, a local lady in the mountains and drinking butter tea with her in her subterranean little dwelling that's almost carved out the earth. That's also exciting. So there's sort of le levels of excitement there, which are very precious to me and which I've, I've written in my books. Okay, yeah, all of them sound super, <laughs> super exciting. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Um, so you must have seen so many animals and birds on your trip, on your, on, in the Amazon River expedition. Was it really cool? I hate to disappoint you, but, you know, you got a motor on your dugout canoe and everything shoes away. And I knew there were caiman there at the side of the riverbank. And I knew there were just some amazing birds there. But they, they all kind of like hear that motor because because when Isabella Godin did it, she was being, you know, polled and there was no electric motor, but now there's a motor. In. So really the animals that I saw in the Amazon were birds, carrots flying very ho high above, um, terrapins on little logs floating in the river and pink dolphins. <coughs> saw in an animal rescue reserve, I saw an anaconda and, and a sloth, but they weren't wild. They were, they'd been rescued. There were also animals that had been orphaned and looked up, were being looked up to by school children. And I saw a girl younger than you who had a pet monkey who she kept and she took it to school and she was wearing a t-shirt and there's rips in the t-shirt where this little monkey was clinging onto her all the time and he ripped her t-shirt. And I guess that was quite cool because, um, as I say, its parents had been orphaned. It was an orphaned little monkey. And then on the, uh, further on down the river, there was the same thing with a boy. He had a pet sloth, which he took to school with him. And it, again, it was, it was hugging him. And we were very fascinated to see him, but he wasn't letting go of it. He wouldn't let us hold it. You know, he was like very protective. So in terms of animals, yes, um, I did see um, a capybara in the Yanganetis in Ecuador, um, which is a, like a very huge guinea pig. <laughs> and, and then I heard other things. You always hear other animals, but you know, they don't like humans. And I don't like snakes. And luckily, humans don't like snakes either. And they they, they slither off, you know, when they hear humans. So I was never gonna let a snake stop me from doing what I wanted to do. I had to face my fears. And I, and I, I think that's probably my biggest fear that I had to face was snakes. I don't think snakes are that scary. I've had a snake around my neck. Oh. They won't really do anything unless you do something for them. Oh, you're right. I, I just think put feet on it and it becomes a lizard and I'm happy with it. I just, I just don't like them. And I, I'm sorry to all the snakes in the world that I don't like you. I just don't. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Good for you. So you could be an explorer because you like snakes. So that's fine. And pink dolphins. Lots. And an anaconda. That just yeah. amazing. Did you see an yeah. anaconda eat um, a caiman or something? Yeah, I, I kept my distance from that anaconda. But lo along the Amazon, along these tributaries, I did get told stories. Like the, the boatman would say, Oh, over there, a soldier got eaten by an anaconda. I go, Right, thank you. That's a nice story. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> um, pink dolphins are incredible, and I did swim with them because they love the warm water and the Amazon is like a hot bath and you swim in them and they're very primeval looking. They've got they kind of like little raggy, raggy fins. And, and uh, yeah, so there's still quite a few of those. That, that was quite thrilling. Yeah, also the anacondas, they can unhinge their jaw. They just swallow any, anything, just one bite. They eat jaguars. I know, I know, yes. I, I, I didn't see one of those. I, um, there was a border post between, um, on, on the tributary, um, 
of the Bobanaza and Pastaza, that was between Ecuador and Peru, and that was an army post, and they had uh, the conscripts there. And I was told that they were playing football, and one of the soldiers ran off to get the ball, which went by the bank of the Amazon, well, of the uh, Pastaza, and they never saw him again. <laughs> You know what happened to him, don't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. So that was another story that we got told along the way, yeah. And then one more story, um, they showed us a hut. And I, I think what's it very extraordinary about when you're going down a tribute to the Amazon is you go hours, like almost days, without seeing anybody at all. And suddenly there is a hut and there's people living in it because you see this little wisp of smoke and you go, what? How can these people live here? There is nothing, just just solid forest. And then there is this little kind of like, little community in there. But anyway, um, on one of those occasions, I was told that um, this anaconda had this woman's husband in its jaws and she ran back to the hut and got the sh a gun and she shot the anaconda and pulled her husband out. So yeah, that's my anaconda stories for you. But to talk about these little communities, one day we, we stopped at um, one of these little huts and my boatmen were Kichwa, Kichwa boatmen. They had to be really, really careful. They didn't stop at Achwa. I mean, if, they just, if we'd have stopped on Achwa land, it would have been a really difficult situation. Kichwa, they were Kichwa, Kichwa are very friendly. And we went, uh, we went ashore and we sat there and there was, this woman and she was wearing pink lipstick and she had this skirt on and she looked lovely. And there she lived in this hut with her children and her hunter-gatherer husband. And, and I think there are a couple of them. And I was thinking that there was no walls to the hut. I was thinking, this is her home. This is, and her, this is her home, this is her culture. And her culture is very rich. She's not poor because that's her culture. But what? how would you and I, if we were sleeping the night there in impenetrable darkness and all those sounds in the darkness coming out of the forest. I mean, it, it, you know, I, I just, I couldn't imagine what that must be like, but um, that was the reality of it. And, and I, I was very interested in how people live. And again, this is, this is not people who are poor because their culture is rich, like a little stream and they've got up a little um, plastic, shower curtain and there's a hollow in the stone and there's a soap there and that's their bathroom and you just think yes that's fantastic there's flowing clean water going through and isn't that as good as any bathroom i mean i was happy to use those bathrooms remove any stray caiman first and i'm happy about it caiman is like a cro crocodile you know that yeah yeah okay what's your next expedition Oh, I'm so excited about the next expedition. The next expedition has been on my list for so long and I'm trying to make it a reality at the moment. Um, and that is to walk the Baker Trail across northern Uganda. Now, Sir Samuel Baker is a Victorian explorer who was part of the, and we're talking about in the 1860s, 1850s, he was part of the, the expedition to find the source of the Nile. And uh, he was traveling through Europe and found his wife being sold in a slave auction. And she was, she was a white Austrian Hungarian. And he, he took her and ran with her and they became inseparable the rest of their lives. And because he knew the lay of the land, Sir Samuel Baker was asked by the Prince of Wales in the 1870s to go and with a small army, and to try and suppress the slave trade in <coughs> what is southern Sudan and northern Uganda. And they, along the way, they had many, many problems as well as freeing many slaves. So they, they had, at one point, 2,000 freed slaves who were, who they gave them their freedom and they, you know, they gave them all a, a cow or something to get on with their lives, just quite incredible. So they pushed their way down through the White Nile, they were pushing their way through more and more. And a very villainous uh, 
slave trader called Abu Sayyid or something like that, was going ahead and spreading malicious talk about them because, of course, they didn't want to suppress, suppress the slave trade. And, of course, you realize that it was Africans that were trading in, in the slaves anyway. So as they pushed on, they made forts to try and establish this route where they could go down there and stop the flow. And this, um, it got to the point in Masindi in, in uh, northern Uganda where they were trying to establish a relationship with a tribal chief by giving them whatever they wanted to give them, give them gifts and give them gifts but it began to turn against them. And finally, they realized that he was amassing a, tri a, a, a tribal army. And one morning, they started to run. And for seven days, they were chased and they were fired at. And her own lovely African boys that she had saved and who were very, become her children practically, were shot beside her with arrows. And they ran and ran around seven days and they ran and it was still successful, but that was pretty awful. So I want to walk that trail where she had to run to freedom. Now, in my walk, and I'm hoping that a film company will be coming with me, I want to, to talk about slavery. I want to talk about slavery today, modern slavery. The fact that there are unfortunately still slaves in the world and as well as talking about the history of the suppression of the slave trade in, in, that, because, in that part of the world because of course they were going up into Egypt and a lot of those those men, women and children were being sold, a lot of them into the Ottoman Empire. So 1872, if you think that's quite a long time after we abolished slavery in, in Great Britain, that that was still going on. Um, and a great lady and Florence Baker ended up her life living out her life in Devon and her grave is in Devon and there she she um, she didn't want to go back because of course Samuel Baker was uh, was asked to go back and she said no not without me and I'm not going back and so they did their bit and I'm very very excited to be doing this it's I've waited quite a long time and I'm setting all up at the moment I have to make sure I'm safe I have to walk through two game reserves and I have to be escorted through them for obvious reasons. <laughs> I have to be escorted through by experts because, you know, if, if we got attacked, well, we won't get attacked, but you know, there, there, if this is a game reserve. So it's the most beautiful part of the world. So we have got the Ugandan tourism um, department very interested in this expedition. And I'm going to be doing this in October and what I can do, if you want, is I can keep you connected and you'll, perhaps your class might be interested and we can, we can bulletin you constantly about where we are, what we're doing. Would that interest you? Definitely. Do you think your class might be interested? Yeah. Because it's a great story and some of the ancestors of the Bakers are still alive today and I'm, I'm hoping to go and talk to them before I go. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be walking 200 miles or something like that across Northern Uganda. This has been really exciting. I'm sure some of the girls watching our channel are wondering if they can become explorers too. Where do they start? Well, as I said, it's a difference between an explorer and an adventurer. So if you walk or cycle around the world or cycle across a country or row the, Atl the Atlantic, you're more of an adventurer and I'm, I'm not, I'm really too old for that now. You know, you might, um, you might wonder how I'm going to walk across Uganda with my kind of, my legs are getting a bit kind of achy now, I'm getting older. But um, starting off as an adventurer and, and wanting to see the world that way is, is a good way of starting. And there are so many fabulous websites now and so many ways to get involved and you've got magazines just for women and women adventures and they're quite easy to find and it's quite easy now to join an expedition whereas when I was trying to find an expedition 20 years ago it was impossible because you had to be like a university graduate or part with field trips and like that so the world has opened up and 
I think if you if you want to really push the boat out and do something on your own, that you have to have an element of courage. And I think that if anyone was going to go and do something on their own, my advice would be, and I always give this advice to people, is if you are on your own in another country, you always listen to local knowledge because the local people know best. We can't go into another country and presume that we know better than them, more than them. That it, we always listen to local knowledge and that's, I think, how we got down the Amazon safely and that's how we got across Siberia safely and up Camp Cameroon is by asking the local people and getting them on your side and becoming their friends. And then they take you into their heart and then they they tell you things and, and then you realise that you are you are finding things out and you are an explorer. Okay. Yeah, that is really good advice. Um, <laughs> I'm sure lots of people would hear this and hopefully they will try and become an explorer and try doing stuff that you did. How, where did this wonderful interest come from for you in women and, and feminism and, and what is nurturing it for you? <coughs> well, I just think it's really, um, well, I just think there are still gender inequalities in the world and mm -hmm. they should fix them. Women should get the same money as men. They should get the same. Um, they should get the same opportunities as men. They can do everything that men do. Absolutely. Uh, the theme of International Women's Day, which was this week, is breaking the bias. So, do you still? Do you think we still have quite a long way to go to break the bias and get equality, or do you think that, that things are better? Things are getting better. Um, might take a couple more years for everything to become properly solid, for women to have the same um, opportunities as men. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think we're getting there. So I wrote the biography of Isabella Bird, and she became the first female fellow of the Royal Geographical Society, which was such a male bastion. And after she became a fellow, like she got elected in as a fellow, they unelected her because there was so much feeling against women should not be allowed that they reversed it. And then she had to wait a few more years to be allowed back in again. I mean, we have, well, it took, a, you know, it took 120 years, really, for that, for, for things to begin to get better in a lot of ways. I mean, you know, male dominated societies i think are on their way out but it does seem unfair doesn't it yeah thanks a lot for coming jackie i had so much fun with you you are very inspiring well i think you are the future young lady and i'm very impressed by you so thank you so much for asking me and let's keep in touch with the next expedition i'm on yes uh-huh definitely okay thanks a lot Thanks.